The Gansort Tournament by Watermelons Melon Felon. Chapter 27. Hermione stared in awe at the large package that Bellatrix had just levitated in front of her. On it was a card addressed to her, from the Dark Lord himself. Miss Granger, for outstanding deduction and research, as well as bringing your findings forward and helping to protect hundreds of lives. May you find this helpful. Make certain Bellatrix is present whenever you use it. She shall instruct you accordingly, as I once taught her. Lord Voldemort. Bellatrix was seated across from her, storm gray eyes obsessively fixated on the box between them. Her hands trailed over it reverently, fingers flexing every few seconds. The Dark Lord! She breathed in obvious amazement. Told me that you would need my assistance more than anything, dear Hermione. A gift from our lord is of the utmost importance, and you should be honored to have gained its favor. In a way, she kind of was. Hermione hadn't done any of her research in order to get brazen gifts. She'd done it because the entire situation with Heracles had bothered her very much, and things didn't make sense to her. Getting rewarded for all of her hard work and getting acknowledgement, however, was very much appreciated. It proved that Voldemort valued effort and intelligence. And the man had kept his word as well. The brunette set aside the green and silver card and pulled the box closer. It was dark and made of a wood she was not familiar with, and the lid was heavy when she pushed it up and creaked ever so slightly. Inside rested a book with a cover that looked like it was made of silver fur, almost like the monster book of monsters without the dangerous fangs. Bellatrix's soft gasp was enough to let her know that this was more than just some book. There was something more to it entirely. Voldemort had really given her something unique. The Lestrange lady gave a shuddered breath. The Dark Lord has seen fit to gift you with the access to necromancy under supervision. Wow. She looked up, finding herself looking her tutor in the eye. Bellatrix leaned across the desk, eyes imploring for her utmost attention. The last! person my lord chose to teach this branch of dark arts to was myself. Severus had the talent but was uninterested. We have waited for someone to show positive interest in more than dark curses to use on their foes. And here you are, my darling little gem. You will treat it with the respect it deserves. By the time she finished, her voice has ascended from monotone to pitchy excitement that was the audible equal to the mad look in her eyes. You feel the time ready for such responsibility? asked Hermione, feeling only a sliver of self-doubt. Necromancy took much more than concentration and a powerful magical core. She had only graduated a year ago. Was this something she should be getting into so soon? The Dark Lord would not have gifted you with such a tone if he did not believe you were ready. True, he was putting an enormous amount of trust in her skills and determination to better herself. There had never been a muggle-born necromancer in the history of the magical community of Britain. Most muggle-borns were too affected by their muggle upbringings and would only view it as a demonic art. There was, in fact, much more to it than summoning demons and spirits, but their reluctance to educate themselves and the comfort in just believing what anyone told them deterred any possible interest in the subject. And now Hermione was going to learn with the aid of her trainer, who seemed more proud than she ever had before. I am ready, the younger witch decided with a firm nod. Besides, it would be lovely to have something else to do beyond her boring office work. Since the ministry didn't seem to be getting any better, this would have to do. A manic grin like that of the Cheshire cat split across Bellatrix's face. Wonderful, she purred. Voldemort blinked in utter astonishment, having not expected the words that had just come from Mary's mouth. His mind played back the entire conversation so he could verify for himself what had just been asked, that no, he was not imagining anything. It was time for lunch, not that he was actually eating. There was too much paperwork to be done over the entire Heracles in France situation. Minister Bertrand was a pain in the arse and was too young, in Voldemort's opinion, to lead a country. He relied too heavily upon his secretaries and arbors. He was also far more invested in earning Voldemort's affections than doing his job. 
Harry Potter had walked right into his office like he owned the place, which was almost true since they were betrothed and Harry would eventually be wedded to him. Hopefully. Still, the young wizard led an entire tray of food into the room and then closed the door with a wave of the hand. It was a collection of finger sandwiches and some tea that he'd no doubt collected from Voldemort's elves. I came to see you and decided to get your lunch since I knew you would be too busy to eat without a reminder. The tray hovered over a spot on the desk ready to drop any second once it was cleaned off. Sighing, he'd set aside his work and the objects on his desk began to move aside of their own to make room for Harry's bounty. So, Foldy, the other began knowing full well that he hated to be called that. Have you ever been to a wedding? He reached out and grabbed a sandwich, taking a bite and waiting patiently. Unfortunately, was his all-too-honest answer. He had been to many a wedding in his years of being a dark lord. It was a rather small punishment to suffer through in order to keep his followers and friends in line. Having the most powerful wizard in the world at your wedding made it more special, or some ridiculous tripe like that. It also kept them loyal to an extent if they thought he was honestly interested in such things. I don't see the appeal of the festivities that always follow. They play terrible drab music and the gossip is dull. He hated the poor taste of music most purebloods had. They refused to leave the 1800s and he could not tolerate it. The admittance, of course, got him a loud snort from Harry who was smiling widely. Sirius and Remus are finally getting married. And in true marauder fashion, their wedding date has been decided on the most dangerous day of the year. Voldemort obviously didn't understand the amusement shining at him through Harry's eyes and leveled the young man with an expectant look. It obviously wasn't Voldemort's birthday, so when was it taking place? April Fool's Day, Voldemort. Fred and George Weasley are going to be some blank party favors. It's their birthday, too, and they are glad for it. A double reason to celebrate and with people they actually like. But it also means exposure for their business. Distantly, Severus's voice rang through his memory. Back during the consort tournament, after the second task, when Voldemort was reviewing the happenings during said task and wanting the input of his knights, Severus had ended up saying much about the Weasley twins. They truly have been some of the most annoying mischief makers I have ever had the misfortune of encountering, but they are quite brilliant in their own right. They have been working tirelessly in opening the joke shop that they have dreamed of owning for years. Pranksters were employing equally mischievous pranksters to help their wedding that was to be held on the International Day of Pranking. Merlin preserved the health of those in attendance. It would be hell all around. I wish you luck, he told his consort with intense honesty. He wouldn't want to be on guard for the entire night. Harry's face flushed and he wiggled in his seat, shoulders touching at Dad. Well... I was hoping you'd be my plus one. And that was what led him to staring in stunned silence. He had been asked to attend a wedding, and all that it included, by his consort. His consort, who was related to the couple that was to be wet. The couple that was gray in magic but light aligned. The couple that was firmly on the opposite side of his when the war had concluded. And Harry wanted to take him to such an event that was close to the hearts of his family and acknowledge their growing bond in front of all who attended. There was a wary light in Harry's eyes, green flashing almost ominously with his unvoiced worry. He'd gone through the trouble of coming over and asking in person, which would take fortitude. It was more personal that way, instead of cowering behind parchment. The young man had put himself out there. Voldemort hated what usually transpired at weddings, but... He would be with Harry. It wasn't annoying. For you, I will go. He relented. It couldn't be so horrible with Harry there, correct? He could simply stare at his consort all evening. Harry was out of his seat in a flash and rounding the desk in order to plant a kiss on Voldemort's glamour cheek. Thank you. If you were there, I know it'll be more tolerable. I mean, I have a say in some of the things such as entertainment, but I have little patience for socialization, which will be a necessary evil considering all who are involved. Voldemort wouldn't admit it aloud, but he secretly enjoyed that Harry viewed such an event in a better light so long as Voldemort joined him. 
And to think over a year ago, the young man hadn't wanted anything to do with them. There really had been progress in their relationship. There will be pranks, won't there? He asked after a moment of silence, and Harry leaning on his desk to get close without overstepping boundaries that Voldemort didn't really have. But he also found it humorous how his consort was trying to be mindful of his personal space and decided to keep his observation to himself for the time being. Yeah, everyone has to wear white, too. Why? He hated white. Let's just say it's part of the entertainment. Harry's eyes practically glowed with mirth, though he revealed no more information. That didn't make him feel any better, though. He hoped that the entire affair wasn't going to be a horrible memory down the line. Harry's fingers occasionally brushing against his hand made him less anxious, though. Sev, you won't believe what kind of music that Sirius intends to play at the reception. Since you decided not to come to the wedding, I promise that I will send you my memory so you may enjoy it without having to personally deal with anyone. And when you get a view of what I have imagined is going to happen, you may as well die now. The Dark Lord is coming. With Harry, Sev, he actually agreed to come. I don't know whether to be worried or amazed, or maybe a mixture of the two. But Harry seems completely ecstatic over it, so I suppose it's a good thing that they are having more outings beyond our lunch here and there. And yes, Harry has told me about how they share meals together now and then. It's been an interesting past few months. James and Sirius are both worried still over the information on Heracles. Voldemort sent out notices to each head of every family instead of just announcing the news to the whole of the community in the paper. It was done so the Dark Lady can't be made aware ahead of time of the fact that we're expecting her. The wedding is set and the amount of protections Harry and Remus have set up are ridiculous. I did help a bit, but those two were very insistent, and to be honest, they are better at warning than I am. Harry even called in Bill Weasley just in case. I'm hoping the danger will pass soon. The last two years have been far too busy for my liking. Looking forward to hearing from you. Liz. Lily. Only Black and Lupin would hold their wedding day on such a ridiculous date. Yet, if I'm being honest, it suits the idiots very well. And from what I know of Black, he probably plans to play muggle music, just to stick it to the purebloods in attendance. That would be something he would love to do as a final respectful version of a rude, rude gesture to his roots. As if marrying a werewolf wouldn't be enough to give old Wildberger a stroke, as it is. I don't even want to think about how Potter managed to convince the Dark Lord to attend such an event. He detests weddings, and every time he must go to one, he is cross for many days afterwards. Rarely have his knights noticed, however, but it is rather obvious when it happens every time someone gets married. Plans are already in place for Heracles. Worry not about her. The Dark Lord would not let her continue being a threat to his people or his consort. Bellatrix has told me that Hermione Granger has now begun studying necromancy. I find this a more scintillating topic than most others as of late. I knew she was a talented witch, but I never expected this from Ms. Granger. And she is seeing my gut son as well. Now yeah, things can change, Lily. I never expected any of this. Severus. Sev. On the subject of Hermione, I am impressed, and I think her and Draco are super adorable together. I saw them at the Yule Ball, and they were dancing without a care in the world. Sirius is interested, though he pretends he isn't. But when a pureblood from a somewhat bigoted family starts seeing a muggle-born, there is always going to be a tension involved. I'm not shocked Hermione has shown an interest in other branches of the dark arts. She has always been an overachiever, and I think this might play into it a bit. Someone is showing her attention and training her beyond levels she wouldn't have reached without said attention, so she's lapping up everything thrown her way while she can. Though, if I may confide in you, I do not think Bellatrix would cast her aside any time soon. Or even later. Both are as thick as thieves, and Hermione is supposed to be seated with the Malfoys and Les Strangers at the wedding. Her seat is between Dracos and her masters, both families together. Except for Roger Lestrange, Hermione got permission for him to be seated with the Weasleys because he, George, and Fred are in a bond of sorts. They'll be expanding their relationship once he reaches his 16th birthday, and they need to be seen together in public more often. Did you know that Bellatrix visited Molly for Christmas and that they spent the whole day together? Awaiting your no-doubt amusing reply, Lils. Lily. 
Bellatrix Lestrange and Molly Weasley are terrifying in their own ways. If they get together at all in the future, we are all doomed. I shudder to think of them becoming in-laws and perhaps even, dare I write it, friends. Bellatrix is even allowing her son to see the twin devils. A year ago, she was dead set on your son marrying her youngest. That was a most strange time indeed. And Potter, I've been completely bewildered by her exclamations about it. Your son is not easy to fluster, I have learned. As for him, he sent me something interesting on my birthday this year. Perhaps you can tell me why your son knows that I have a liking for muggle musicals and why he sent me a Walkman with dozens of tapes and batteries as well as directions on where to get more. Perhaps not as amusing a reply as you wanted. Severus. Sev, I don't know what you're implying, but I am innocent until proven guilty. Liz. Nagini slithered along the cold floor, hissing threateningly at every house elf she saw, and one may wonder why she was in such a foul mood. It was easy. Her master and Harry were leaving her! They got to go out and have fun, and Nagini was expected to stay at home and behave. There was no appreciation. She gave a hissy chuckle when the elves scurried at the sounds of her displeasure. Yes! Flee in terror! Too bad she wasn't allowed to hurt them. Vashti, the head of the elves, shook her finger in Nagini's face, however. She wasn't easily afraid like the others. Master Voldy Bess is giving you Mother's Day gift already, Nagini! You need to behave or Vashti must report bad attitude! So what if a few days ago she's been given a full two-legger to consume on the day of two-legger mothers? She'd been forgotten TODAY! And it wasn't right. This whole wedding business was a conspiracy against snakes. She didn't know what conspiracy was, but her master regarded them terribly, so she was sure this was a conspiracy against her. All that trouble in raising her whiny little serpent into the whiny big serpent he was today. She'd give him the gold shoulder as a punishment. That would show him. All she needed to do was find out how to give a cold shoulder when she was a snake. But it would come to her eventually and he'd learned the error of his ways for leaving her at the manor with no entertainment. Sirius looked around, spotting the wild air of Bellatrix and her children easily, as well as the platinum blonde of Narcissa and her son. They shared a table, as in Bella Strange's and Malfoy's and Hermione Granger, since she was Draco's date and Bellatrix's apprentice. However, the couple he was looking for the most had not yet appeared. And Harry had confirmed that Voldemort would be attending and was made aware of some of the risks of doing so and had agreed anyway. Bowie's late twins had cooked up some very interesting concoctions for this day and Sirius was excited to see the Dark Lord covered in bright colors no matter which way it happened. He wanted to see the man without the perfect pureblood attitudes and stuffiness. Siri, there they are, said Ramus at his left. Both of them were bedecked in pristine white suits that would be colorfully decorated by the end of the evening. Ramus looked especially good in white, Sirius noted with a glance to his left. But enough of that, there was time for those thoughts later on. Ramus was directing his attention to the main entrance of the hall where Harry and Voldemort had just walked in arm in arm and looking more flashy than he had expected. The Dark Lord's entire body looked taut, as if ready for an assault from any direction. In a way, it was hilarious, but in another, it made him appreciate being taken seriously to an extent. Ramus hissed in sympathy when the two were immediately set upon by all manner of gossiping magical guests. Those who wanted to greet the Dark Lord, since no one had been informed of his invitation, and those who wanted to speak with Harry, Magical Britain's resident orator. The two were a power couple to the extreme. They look good together. Sirius's other half remarked, making him whip his head around in shock. The resulting crack hurt just a little. Ramus smiled softly. They do. It helps to know that Harry actually likes him. Yeah, they'd all gotten to hear Harry gush about his new poultry chills that Voldemort had gotten him for Valentine's Day. If anything, the man knew how to play to people's desires. Also, how did he get his hands on two of some of the most rare magical creatures that existed? There were such pains to find, and it was impressive to even find one. By now, several more people were crowding around the couple, and Sirius sighed. Lasgo sighed, the moaning. 
It would never forget that minor look of panic that flashed across Voldemort's face as more and more people appeared out of the blue to ask questions. It was hilarious, and he kept the memory forever. Remus, after the peacemaker, managed to part the sea of guests and ask for some time with his godson and his fiancée. Only common decency had been holding the others back, but eventually they all returned to their tables in order to look on, utterly enraptured with the spectacle the couples no doubt made, especially since the Dark Lord made up one half of a couple. Well, you're looking good, Sirius said, looking him over now that he was closer. Harry's hair had been freshly trimmed once again, so the sides were short while the top center was large and curly. The curl hanging over his brow was still shaped like a lightning bolt, and it gave him a roguish appearance. His eyes, always brighter than Lily's and more reminiscent of the killing curse, were outlined by a small bit of black that he was certain Luna Lovegood had done for him since his godson knew nothing about the wonders of makeup. All in all, in his crisp suit, he looked great. And Voldemort, with his glamour as always, looked perfect, with not a perfectly coiffed hair out of place. You too. He glanced down and then back up. Are you doing the ceremonial silks then? Ah! Oh, Remus breathed with a subtle shake of the head. Actually, we had planned that, but then Albus offered to make us rings instead. Said he had a special design in mind, even. Harry's brows shot up and he looked to Voldemort. Isn't magical smithing incredibly difficult? Hmm... The man nodded. Few have the strength nor patience to learn the art in full. Let me guess, you're perfect at it as well, right? They all watched as the Dark Lord's mouth thinned just a bit. He then said, much to their collective astonishment, Actually, I am rather horrible at it, no matter how much I try. They were all gaping at the man, which was allowed because he admitted to not being good at something! It was a shame the papers would not be allowed into the building. That would have been on the front page within the morning. But Sirius only wanted specific details escaping to the world, meaning a single reporter was inside and the rest of the night's events had to come from word of mouth. It's okay, said Harry solemnly, patting the man's shoulder. I still think you're amazing, so no need to worry yourself over it. Voldemort's small grin had Ramus and Sirius sharing a look of shock all their own. Perhaps he really did like Harry more than just as a companion. Nothing bad has happened yet, Harry noted as he and Voldemort sat at the table that his parents and godparents would also be sitting at. Voldemort sitting with the Potters was a damn riot in his head, though he said nothing about it aloud. And just two years ago, this wouldn't have ever crossed Harry's mind. Yet being the operative word... I know those twins of yours, and if Severus is going to put stock into their claims, then I know to take them seriously. As for your marauders, I know enough about their exploits to definitely be wary. Putting both groups together is asking for trouble. The Slytherin consort snorted, but allowed the man to continue his watch for suspicious activity heading in their direction, if only to get him to relax a bit once he was in a familiar mindset. Nothing would happen until... After the vows had been made, but he wouldn't tell Voldemort that. During his perusal of the room, he noticed Albus Dumbledore in the distance. The hall the ceremony and reception were taking place in was the same size as the Great Hall at Hogwarts. More lavish inside, though, and festooned with only white decorations in order to fit in with the games and tricks planned for the evening. How could one have an April Fool's wedding and not have tricks after all? Harry had a personal hand in it since he was the third major shareholder of Weasley's Wizard Wheezes and the twins had outdone themselves. After the wedding and the interviews were given, they'd be officially selling their new merchandise within the week. Basically, the wedding was going to be a very useful business maneuver on their end. Anyway, back to Dumbledore who was across the massive hall dressed in sensible robes for once. White, but sparkling which wasn't offensive to the eyes in the least. Ramus and Sirius were speaking with him, no doubt getting ready for the bonding ceremony. Dumbledore was the officiator as well, so him making them their bonding gifts was certainly more than required of him. Perhaps it was the actions of an old man living in the moment. Maybe he was reminiscing about when they were still children. Who could ever know what Dumbledore was thinking? Though anyone would be foolish to deny a personally crafted gift from Albus Dumbledore, who was one of the greatest and oldest wizards alive presently. On the topic of his great age, 
Harry was reminded of Flamel and Heracles and also remembered that protections had been put up at the wedding just in case. And with Voldemort in attendance, should Heracles make an appearance, his unplanned presence would certainly put a damper on things, and multiple plans were in place in case something went wrong and the guests could get to safety. Everything was outlined perfectly, and they had all memorized the instructions. Moments later, a loud bell rang throughout the hall, and the guests all seated themselves as Dumbledore and the soon-to-be-wedded couple took their stances near the table. Harry's parents spared Voldemort respectful nods, but nothing beyond that. The man nodded in return at least, so all was well. He could actually imagine them getting on in the future. The ceremony was only the third Harry had ever been to, and was not like the others. For one, Dumbledore did not use the red silk method to bind the couple like most tended to like in the wizarding world. Nor did he use the rings meant for fingers like muggles tended to favor. No, his rings were more like Harry's consort ring, meaning they were worn on the wrists instead and were large and extravagant in order to draw the eye. Harry couldn't see well from where he sat, but he was certain there was gold and a red gem of some sort involved. His godfathers held hands and said their vows. Ramus was more serious, while his husband Dubé was more energetic, yet no less earnest. When given the chance, Sirius could be quite the sweet talker. Many ladies in the audience sighed in admiration at his profession of always caring for Mooney. This was the day that Harry had been waiting for, for, for over a decade. He was so happy to see two people who genuinely cared for one another, realizing their feelings and coming together for a union that magic blessed every time. One day, Harry's own union would be blessed by magic. He cast a sideline glance to Voldemort, who was watching the proceedings closely. The man was obviously interested, but was attempting not to show it. But that made Harry think. Voldemort was taking in the details of this wedding, perhaps in preparation for a wedding of his own in the future. A wedding he intended Harry to be an equal part of, Harry was aware. By force of will, was Harry able to hold back his blush? Lots of him and Voldemort getting married could wait for later, of them exchanging vows and promising to be faithful for all eternity and then consummating their marriage with Voldemort not wearing that bloody glamour. Harry would become a tomato if he didn't stab himself. A bright flash brought him back to the present, where the lead wedding photographer was at work, while Padfoot and Mooney were at another kind of work. Snagging, to be precise. Very intense snagging and groping. The entire hall jumped to their feet to clap, though Voldemort followed along at a much more sedate pace. Still, he too applauded the wedded couple and nodded his head to them in acknowledgement. Muggle rack music began to play, sounding from all over thanks to a special spill Harry's mother had invented. Sirius had gotten his wish since Ramus didn't care for music in general and, of course, would choose this kind of music. And now it was time for photo session number one. Each guest would take a photo at the beginning and then a second one at the end to show the progression of the night's events. Copies would be sent out a month later. Harry dragged Voldemort into the photo with him, though we could tell the man didn't mind so much. He got to hold Harry very close, which appealed to him far more than actually posing for the photo. Harry knew exactly where he was going to put his copy of their photo as he stood with Voldemort's hands settled on his lower back, bodies facing each other, though their heads were turned to the camera. He'd put it right on the front counter at the shop so everyone could see it. This was definitely a lot better with Voldemort here. Once they returned to their seats, Harry and Voldemort found themselves with Remus and Sirius again. Harry's parents were off with one of the other photographers. Without even having to ask, Harry's godfathers presented their rings for he and Voldemort to see clearly. The rings were like golden cuffs, spanning about the smallest finger length and were very thick. The face was intricately carved to depict a scene of a dog laying by a lake beneath a full moon. The rest held a delicate lattice design with stones that resembled rubies, though far fancier than any rubies he'd ever seen, set within. The red stones seemed to glow with an inner fire, and he felt almost enchanted by them. Dumbledore really held nothing back. I can't believe Albus managed to make those at his physical state, Voldemort stated, looking as equally amazed. Harry silently agreed. Dumbledore had aged considerably in prison, and he honestly looked old. 
When looking upon him, Harry struggled to remember that magical humans were more hardy than muggles. So just because Dumbledore looked ancient didn't mean he was incapable, despite his almost 12 decades of life showing easily. I can see that he pandered to the Gryffindor colors, Harry noted with a wry smirk. I'm not shocked, really. The two lovebirds smiled at one another and sat back in their seats, hands clasped together. Remus appeared serene, which Harry knew was going to fly out the window once the festivities began. No way would Sirius allow him to remain docile for too long. Remus was a prankster as well, even if he was better at hiding it. He would join in soon enough with the proper encouragement. His attention swung around to Voldemort, whom Harry noticed was bobbing his head to the music. Said music consisted of Freddie Mercury belting out the lyrics to the well-known song Bohemian Rhapsody. As in, Lord Voldemort was actually willingly listening to muggle music and his lips glitched every now and then as he tried to hold back the urge to sing along. Voldemort? New Queen. Harry would never let him live it down. A high-pitched shriek sounded through the music and the inhabitants of the table turned to see where it came from. One of the guests, whom Harry didn't know personally, but knew was of a noble family, was holding up a green-colored canary that was chirping madly in her palm. Sirius snorted first before his barking laugh joined the noble turn bird. They ate a canary cream, remarked Harry with a disappointed shake of the head. They attended the wedding of two marauders that is being held on the biggest prank day of the year and just blindly trusted the sweets at the table. Disappointing. Shameful, right, Grant? You are absolutely right, Forge. Grinning, Harry turned around almost completely to lay eyes on the twins, who were wearing matching burgundy and brown pinstripe suits, golden waistcoats, and brown bow ties. They stood at an imposing height of 197 centimeters, naturally, and beamed down at the table. What exactly is a canary cream? Voldemort demanded, not looking away from the spectacle that was close to ending if Harry's timing was correct. As if by prediction, the canary molted instantly and reverted back to a young man who looked bewildered and completely lost. His hair and robes were a mess, but otherwise he was perfectly fine. A healthy mixture of practical joke, cooking, and transfiguration, my lord, said George in a conspiratorial tone. The base idea was actually Harry's and we simply expanded upon it to make it even better. Voldemort sent Harry a bland look. Is everything edible a prank in waiting? Who knows? The teen wondered with a slag grin, though he knew the answer very well and refused to part with it. The answer was a firm, YES! Hmm, at least it's an impressive show of skill. Harry peeked at the twins to see them staring wide-eyed at Voldemort. After all, the man saying that it was impressive had to be the best compliment someone could get from him. And it wasn't a lie, since being able to charm something to transfigure a human's entire form for even a minute took a lot of magical prowess. The twins had been working very hard lately, and they deserved the praise they got for bringing Harry's little idea to life. And the best part about it was... It works on humans, werewolves, vampires, and goblins as well. Being able to change the body of a non-human being was even more difficult for a magical human. And Harry was glad to be able to bump up his friend's abilities. He was proud of them and would brag as much as possible without being a jerk about it. Interesting, was Voldemort's soft reply. An exploding cracker to the face was very annoying, especially since the contents had stained not only his clothing, but also his skin, and it soaked his hair. However, before he could actually get angry, the liquid seemed to evaporate, leaving him perfectly dry again, despite the suit still being stained blue. The sound had caught the attention of the partygoers who watched in minute horror as the Dark Lord remained in contemplative silence. Harry was cackling beside him, slapping a knee as he attempted, very poorly, might he add, to contain himself. Another of the twins' creations. It's a magical dye that dissolves seconds after hitting anything with cloth. That's why everyone had to wear white clothing. The Dark Lord refrained from huffing like he wanted and instead stuffily twitched a finger toward the other crackers at the table. All which rose in the air instantly and proceeded to crack open with loud rolls of thunder all over Harry's head, covering him with various colors and making him a living rainbow. All the people around them were openly gaping like fools, having not expected Voldemort to prank Harry back. 
They probably expected him to punish the bladder heir or at least promise a punishment for later on. You know what this means. Harry began standing slowly in order to give him the only height advantage he'd ever have over Voldemort. Color boy! Harry lunged and the entire hall descended into chaos and everyone took after him and rushed either for crackers or cover! Harry slammed into Voldemort, soaking his clothing even further with more colors and taking them both to the marble floor that was going to be held to clean eventually for whatever poor sad was stuck doing it. And this was what ultimately proved that just because there were mostly adults in attendance didn't mean maturity had ever reached any of them. Meanwhile, Dumbledore merely sat in his seat humming his own version of the Hogwarts school song, which sounded a lot like It's a Small World, and twinkling as he was assaulted from all sides with rainbows. No fight was put up either. Easily sipped tea and hummed. As for Lord Slytherin and his consort, both wrestled, turning over repeatedly until Harry was on top. It was a parody of a position that they would once again be in. In the future, Voldemort hoped. And he was even merciful enough to allow Harry the illusion of victory, staring up at the young man expectantly, wondering if he'd thought his actions through before he moved. He was practically in Voldemort's lap, after all. Voldemort was in no way annoyed by this. The reality of the situation must have finally dawned on him because a nasty of pink bloomed across his eye cheekbones, but he didn't look away. He smiled sweetly and said, I told you that you being here would make everything so much better. If he was being honest, it really wasn't that bad. Far more interesting than any other wedding he'd been to over the years. The music was tolerable, at least. The Slytherin consort puffed a sigh and sent him a forlorn look. Too bad we're in public and have to maintain a modicum of propriety. He then leaned down, gave Voldemort a peck on the lips, and jumped to his feet before the Dark Lord could so much as enjoy the brief moment of contact. Cheeky little bugger it was! An hour later, the entire hall was shuffled along to take their final photos of the evening, where not one person made it out with white clothing. And Voldemort's robes in particular showed colored stains in the shape of a human body, courtesy of Harry holding on to him for a time. Voldemort secretly decided to have his robes preserved, simply because they actually came with a pleasant memory and would remind him of the night when Harry Potter sat on him willingly and then kissed him where anyone could see, proving that their relationship was more than a matter of convenience. He would never forget it. The search for the Philosopher's Stone had led her to this. None of Flamel's friends had the stone, none of his family members had the stone, and there was only one person left for her to confront, and that was Albus Dumbledore, who had disappeared after being freed from Nirmingard. No one knew where he lived, only that he randomly appeared here and there in Magical Britain. But one thing was a common occurrence, according to her watchers. Dumbledore liked taking his phoenix to visit Britain's own orator on a bi-weekly basis, and surely he'd be more willing to talk if there was something more precious on the line than just his own life. Heracles gaggled and downed her daily dose of Skelligro. Soon she'd have her other arm back, and then she'd continue her plans for immortality and the utter domination of magical Europe. <laughs>